All right. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. I don't know why. Um, it's I'm the host, and I provided you all with a link, and it wasn't letting me record. So anyway, um, um, welcome to the second day of our San Francisco Climate Week. Um, we have uh, had talks. Uh, you had an event yesterday on Monday evening, and then we have one today, another one tomorrow evening, uh, uh, and we take a break on Thursday, and we have a fourth event on Friday. And then we have a grand finale that Christina Deptula, my, um, uh, the um, uh, authors, large and small, and uh, uh, my social media champion has uh, organized uh, in cooperation with me. Um, and that Saturday event uh, includes a dance video, um, art, poetry, and so it's entertainment combined with uh, a serious talk by Dr. Jan Kirsch of 350 Bay Area uh, and a, some talk uh, by me. So serious talk merged with um, <laughs> some uh, inspirational uh, things over there. Yes, it's uh, going to be a fabulous and inspirational event with some wonderful poetry and a chance to network with professionals in the sustainability sphere and for ordinary people to be inspired and to think about commitments we can all make and ways that we can all be part of preserving our earth. So I encourage anyone and everyone to come on out to that. I've posted the Eventbrite link in the chat. Please do sign up on the Eventbrite link, even though the event is completely free because we will send you a packet of tree seedlings and um, tree seeds to scatter and plant. And also we're collecting everybody's um, email addresses so that we can send you the Zoom link for security. So yeah, it's free, but do go ahead and sign up on the Eventbrite link, which I have put in the chat. So see you at six o'clock Pacific time this Saturday. Right, and that event, everybody is, to come. that event is free also, everything is free. And uh, so we, we uh, welcome you. Today's event, um, uh, we um, have uh, uh, four speakers and uh, uh, we'll have uh, Jenna Femila talk about MCE and she'll talk about that. Uh, myself will talk about um, uh, um, uh, an energy climate and uh, ecosystem plan I've outlined for California. Uh, hopefully it'll be thought provoking. Um, and um, then we have um, uh, Rand Robel will talk about Bay Area activism. And Richard Rollins will talk about climate emergency mobilization. And we'll get into introductions. And each stage, I'm going to share the screen with you. Uh, I'm allow you, going to allow you to um, share your screen uh, for a particular speaker. And once you get done, please stop sharing. And then that will revert back to me. And then I can enable a second person to the second speaker and so forth. <clears throat> uh, let me get started uh, uh, with uh, Jenna of Femila. Um, Jenna is the uh, communications director uh, at MCE, which is Marine Clean Energy, which is a community choice aggregation um, uh, organization, nonprofit, and she'll tell us more about it. And Jenna, it'd be good um, if you can also tell us uh, something about yourself. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, I assume you have a, 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 present, um, a presentation. Should I? I uh, do. Okay, and let me uh, allow a click on you and um, and allow you to um, share your screen. <clears throat> Great. Well, um, while I'm waiting for that, I'll just introduce myself. So, um, as Hari mentioned, my name is Jenna. I've been with MCE about five years. Um, my background is in sort of informal science education, so I've been. I'm able to work at places like the Bronx Zoo, uh, the California Academy of Sciences. Um, my role at MCE is now focused on uh, marketing and communications, but uh, these public presentations, I, I was a community development manager for a long time um, doing these and getting out in the community. So I've had the opportunity to work at folks, uh, work with folks at 350 Bay Area and Sierra Club and, and others. So um, it's great to be, to be here with everybody today. Um, and I am going to share my screen and um, go through our presentation here. So, um, are folks seeing my note slides or the presentation? Uh, yeah, we can see your slide and, um, and if it's good, everybody 
uh, in the meantime, can mute we themselves. Can see your slides. Is it just the slides, though, or are you seeing the notes? Um, I think it looks like a full screen. Okay. Great. So um, MCE, I'll can, talk. Someone is saying we can see the slides only. Okay. okay. Great. Yeah. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about um, MCE, who we are, and what community choice aggregation is. So MCE, we are a local not-for-profit public electricity provider. Um, so first, a little, a little setting the stage. Um, so we got started to help um, fight climate change, the impacts of climate change. So climate change is something that impacts us all. Um, the changing planet is causing rising temperatures. Uh, we saw that in last year's 2020 extreme heat storm for those of us that are in California. Um, it got very hot and we saw uh, power outages relating to that. We've also, as we've known, the instances of wildfires over the years have increased, um, particularly in Marin County. We're seeing impacts from sea level rise and California is a, st a state where drought is very well documented. Um, but we're also seeing health impacts, things like a longer allergen season, higher rates of asthma and insect borne diseases, things like Lyme disease. So climate change is caused by our greenhouse gas emissions. So this is a snapshot of the total US greenhouse gas emissions by economic sector, sector from 2018. And you can see that 27% um, of that comes from electricity alone. So we're about a little over 50%, almost 60% of our emissions come from transportation and electricity across the country. And this has gone up uh, significantly uh, since the 1850s when we started using fossil fuels as our main method for creating energy um, and operating our vehicles uh, and our boats and things to get places. What's interesting is that in California, in 2018, you can see that electricity was only 15% of the emissions. So pretty dramatic difference between the US uh, population and the California population. And a large part of this is due to the shift in electricity service providers. And MCE is a big part of that. So I'll talk a little bit about how that fits in. So what is community choice? Um, community choice aggregation was passed, was uh, an, enabled by the state of California back in 2002 through Assembly Bill 117. Um, what that did was it enabled local not-for-profit government agencies like MCE to come into a community by vote of the local officials and become the default service provider. So we're an opt-in model. And traditionally, we offer a higher amount of renewable energy um, compared to the traditional investor-owned utility provider. So in uh, up here, that's PG&E, um, but there are three of them um, around the state. So CCAs take over the generation services from the investor-owned utility. Uh, we offer customers a choice of where their electric service comes from, and we're also able to offer um, local benefits, tailored energy services, and um, greater control over where your energy dollars are spent and what choices are made on your behalf. So electricity service can be thought of in a couple different parts. Um, the generation or the source of your electricity and then the delivery, so the transmission and, and distribution. Uh, traditionally, PG&E does both of those items, making sure that you have electricity in your home, um, you receive a bill from them, but when MCE or any other community choice provider comes into a community, we take over the generation source of your electricity. So we choose where that electricity comes from, offering you a more renewable option, while PG&E continues to deliver that electricity to your home or business, and you receive one bill from PG&E the same way that you always would, with just charges from your CCA on there. So community choice did not start in California. It actually started back in Massachusetts and then jumped to Ohio and then to California. So you can see kind of a snapshot here. There are eight states that have authorized community choice programs um, and legislation has been introduced in five more as well as a couple states that are considering um, their options. So uh, it's something that is growing around the United States but also has particularly taken off in California. So MCE was the first community choice provider back in 2010. And then in 2014, the second program launched Sonoma Clean Power. 
since then, things have grown pretty significantly, and we're now up to 24 programs with the creation of San Diego Community Power um, in March, I believe, so just very recently. Um, this is just a snapshot of where these agencies are around the state, and you can see um, who's considering CCA and who is moving in that direction. Um, so you can see a, a very large portion of the state is ser served by community choice providers. Over 200 communities and over 10, actually it's 11 million electric service customers now. So who is MCE specifically? Um, our mission is to address climate change by reducing energy-related greenhouse gas emissions. So we do that first and foremost by providing renewable energy and energy efficiency services to our customers. But because we are a local not-for-profit public agency, we also focus on providing cost competitive rates, creating economic and workforce benefits, and, and uh, very importantly, creating more equitable communities. So MCE formed back in 2008 and launched service to just about 8,000 customers in Marin County back in 2010. Um, mm -hmm. Since then, we have continued to grow and we are up over 480,000 customer accounts um, serving 36 communities across the Bay Area. So here's a snapshot of what that looks like. We serve all of Marin County, all of Napa County, uh, most of Contra Costa County, and a couple of communities in Solano County. We, as of April 1st, actually just uh, began our enrollment for customers in the city of Vallejo and Pleasant Hill. So we are welcoming customers as we speak. So MCE provides our customers a variety of benefits. As a not-for-profit public agency, we don't have shareholders, so we're able to reinvest your dollars locally. We also are controlled by a board of local elected officials who do things like set our rates, determine our power purchasing, and our additional programs that we offer. We also offer stable and competitive rates. Clean energy leadership is a large part of what we do. Um, we are, our standard service is 60% renewable compared to the traditional utility, which is only 29% renewable. Um, and meeting that 60% renewable target meant that we made, met state goals 13 years ahead of time. And we also have been 90% greenhouse gas free since uh, 2019. Oh. We focus on being innovative and efficient. So approximately 90% of our revenues go back into purchasing power for our customers. We have three credit ratings, um, including a recent A credit rating from S&P. Um, that helps us reduce the cost of contracting so that we can help keep our customers' rates um, competitive. What all of this means is that it adds up to some great community benefits. We've been able to reinvest over $180 million locally over the past 10 years, as well as contribute $1.6 billion to new renewables while continuing to build out new um, innovative customer programs. Um, as I mentioned, we are regulated by our board of local elected officials. This is a snapshot of some of them. Um, they are not compensated for sitting on our board and because they are elected officials, um, you have control over who actually regulates MCE. So with MCE, you have a couple energy choices. Um, you can choose to opt out of MCE and return back to PG&E, the traditional utility service. You are automatically enrolled in our 60% renewable service light green, but you can also opt up and choose our 100% renewable service deep green, which is about $5 more a month for the average residential customer. And what's really special about that program is that half of what you pay for that service is allocated directly into local projects and programs. So you're able to see direct reinvestment of your dollars. Um, this is just a snapshot of the bill. Um, I mentioned earlier that PG&E um, delivers one bill to customers that you would see MCE charges on. So you can see here, there's one line item that says current electric charges. This is a typical PG&E bill. Where you would see your CCA show up is that line item is going to be split into two different line items. So you can see here, you have current PG&E electric delivery charges. Um, that is the service that PG&E still provides to you. And MCE takes over the generation. So you see a new line item for MCE electric generation charges. What's important here is that MCE is not a duplicate charge. CCAs are a replacement charge for the generation services that you would have paid PG&E for. Um, here's a sample residential cost comparison for our customers. 
uh, there are a couple different fees that go into a electric bill. So the top line here is your electric generation charge. Um, you can see that MCE's services vary depending on which service you choose. Um, but for our light green and deep green option, which are most, uh, most common service options, they're both significantly less expensive than PG&E's 29% renewable option. Um, electric delivery is the same uh, for all customers because you still pay PG&E for this service. And then there's an additional line item that says added PG&E fees. This fee is something that all CCA customers pay um, to PG&E because PG&E has previously entered into energy contracts on your behalf. They're required to enter into these contracts to make sure that you have electricity available to you. Um, but when customers leave PG&E service, PG&E still has to pay for those contracts even if the customers aren't there to use that energy. So that's what that cost does. It makes sure that pg e can pay those contracts without having to raise rates on their existing customers. Um, that fee is indicated here as a range because it varies depending on when your community left pg e service. Um, so you can see here that bottom line varies. Um, and so some of our customers are gonna be essentially the same as pg e service. Some are gonna be a little bit more. Um, but MCE really focuses on providing stable and competitive rates, as I've mentioned a couple different times. So this rate comparison um, is as of January when PG&E changed their rates. Before that, we were slightly less expensive than PG&E, and we expect that we will be again. Um, MCE has been less expensive than PG&E 70% of the time we've been in operation. We don't guarantee that we're going to be less expensive, but we do guarantee all the other benefits that I've spoken about earlier. Tailored customer energy programs, local control, and ability to see where your dollars are being spent, as well as investment in renewable energy and carbon-free energy resources. Um, if you are on a discount program, such as um, the Care Fair or Medical Baseline rates, um, or you have an PG&E employee discount, those things remain the same. There's no need to reapply. If you have rooftop solar, there's a couple different um, changes in that program with MCE. Um, and most CCAs operate similarly to this, but MCE does monthly assessments of your bill, whereas PG&E, they do an annual true up where they do all of your charges at one time. Um, additionally, if you are someone who produces excess annual generation, MCE will credit you at twice the wholesale rate compared to PG&E, which credits at the wholesale rate. Um, if you're in a community that is new, newly enrolling with MCE, your enrollment will trigger a true up. Uh, so we encourage customers to reach out to us if that's the case, and we can help you determine um, how you can best address that. So MCE's impact across California, we've eliminated almost 500,000 metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions, which is the equivalent of taking over 108,000 cars off the road for an entire year. As I mentioned, our service is 60% renewable since 2017 um, and is planning to be 95% carbon free by 2022. We've helped save our customers over $68 million in rate savings while committing over $1.75 billion to build new renewable projects around California and in our service area, including the 35 new renewable projects built directly in our service area. We offer a variety of customer of community benefits, including um, energy efficiency services, single family um, businesses, and then also a workforce education and training program. Uh, which connects apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship programs with contractors to help get them trained in the energy uh, field. We also offer a electric vehicle charging infrastructure program. This is funded in part through our deep green customers and um, we offer rebates of up to $3,500 per port to help incentivize the development and adoption of electric vehicles in our service area. Our feed-in tariff program, which is where a lot of those 35 megawatts of local projects were built through, um, has a 50% local hire and prevailing wage requirements. So really focusing on good paying jobs, family sustaining jobs. Um, we also offer rebates for income qualified solar customers. We've allocated over $725,000 to these installations. Um, so MCE, I mentioned, has reinvested more than $180 million in our community over the past 10 years, including over $80 million in customer savings, 81 in um, re local renewable projects, $17 million in programs and rebates. And we also launched a $6 million uh, energy resiliency program last year 
to uh, support customers during the newly realized public safety power shutoff. Um, as well as our local employment programs, our workforce development, as I mentioned, and working with local contractors. Uh, we always try to work with local uh, services and vendors whenever possible. Um, so here's a snapshot of our power. Um, in 2019, I mentioned that we were 60% renewable um, compared to PG&E's 29% renewable. And our deep green service is always 100% renewable, 50% wind and 50% solar from California resources. Here's a snapshot of some of our local projects. You can see we, a lot of them are located in Marin because that's where we started first, but we're um, continuing to grow outside in, in our newer counties and that's been a really exciting process. Um, as well as committing over 1.6 billion across the state, um, supporting 5,000 jobs and 1.4 million labor hours. Uh, please um, mute yourself, uh, or who, if you're not speaking, please. Please mute yourself. And that's actually, that's it for my presentation. So um, thank you for having me. And I, I, are we taking questions now or at the very end? Uh, I think we'll be taking questions at the end, um, Jenna, uh, just to make sure that all the speakers get in. And um, thank you for being very efficient with the time. And um, thank you so much. And uh, you can now stop sharing. Okay. Um, Thanks, Jenna. That was a really uh, professional and interesting uh, um, talk. Uh, yeah, I'm going thank you very much. I learned a lot from that. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, there's there's a lot to cover, but um, happy to happy to be here and answer questions. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm myself. I'm uh, have a solar panel, so I'm one of those ones that uh, got a after true up got a little rebate from MCE a rebate check. Uh, and I didn't know that it was twice the wholesale rate. But anyways, we'll, um, we'll be questioning you at the end. Um, let me share my screen, uh, get started, and I'll try and keep mine pretty short and try and restrict it. Uh, right, okay. um, can you uh, stop? You, did you stop sharing? Uh, see. I did. Uh, and host, it says host disabled? Participant sharing. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, gosh. Uh, let me see. Uh, South Korea. Uh, Harry, it looks like you may have accidentally changed the host to me. So I just sent it back over to you. So maybe try again. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. That sounds good. Um, um, let me see uh, where I am at in terms of the uh, MP4, uh, defining PowerPoint, uh, 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 futures. Okay, here you go. <clears throat> All right. Um, can you see that screen? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, let me maximize it so that. Uh, <clears throat> All right. Um, so um, this is. Yes, uh, I can see it. You can see it. Okay, that's beyond great. fossil fuels to a clean, beautiful, and prosperous California. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, I can see it. So. Um, uh, California has been uh, uh, leading uh, climate change activities for quite a while, uh, just like to some extent the European Union among developed nations. Um, it's a pretty big state. Um, it um, imports about 9% of its electricity <clears throat> and uh, from other states. Uh, most of its natural gas is imported. Um, the refineries uh, are mostly located along the West Coast and you have oil coming in from Saudi Arabia uh, as well as from Canada. Uh, we have uh, in the Bay Area itself, uh, um, like the Richmond port that gets oil tankers come in and provide oil to uh, the refinery uh, in Chevron refinery in the Bay Area. And so um, um, California has, um, you know, but California has done quite a bit 
uh, in terms of leading the world, uh, leading the United States. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit to that. We can have, we are uh, relatively clean, beautiful and prosperous, uh, but I think we can be more that way uh, as we uh, proceed uh, with climate change solutions. <clears throat> um, let me, okay. All right. Um, the, um, so this is uh, uh, what I call um, my activity, Brighter Climate Futures. It's this is part of my book. Uh, it's the California part of what I proposed in my book. Uh, I am presenting this today, but I initially presented this at something called the Green Fridays event of the Sierra Club in December. Um, and um, the reason I call it energy is in the, I start my uh, talking about solutions to energy. And I say, we should have, and if we start with having an adequate amount of energy, um, then uh, renewable energy, then we can replace fossil fuels. Um, and so I've usually, I've come at it from the energy end to begin with. <clears throat> uh, this is the book that I, I wrote and was released uh, last September. It's called Brighter okay, Climate. Uh, yeah, Brighter Climate Futures, uh, Global Energy and Climate Ecosystem and Ecosystem Transformation. So it addresses all three areas, the climate, the energy aspect, transition aspect, climate change in terms of M carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide emissions, and then ecosystems, the carbon sinks, like the land and the ocean ecosystems. So I try to address all three. <clears throat> California, when I, I came to California and moved to California in 2017, I used to visit it. And whenever I used to visit it, uh, you see the beautiful forest coast, you know, uh, and uh, deserts and so forth, and you really enjoy them. And you look forward to that. Of course, I remember my first visit, I went to the Redwood National Forest, northern part of California, and uh, went along the coast and was overawed uh, by California's beauty. <clears throat> but California's um, um, uh, the forests are, are, are burning. This is, we've had an enormous uh, impact of wildfires. Uh, this is the Calistoco fire as of October of 2020. Uh, and um, <clears throat> we had almost a, a month full of smoke in the San Francisco area um, from fires uh, um, uh, relatively far away from here. But um, uh, we, from 2017, when I moved to California, it's been exponentially growing in terms of wildfire season. And so you have emissions, the forests are supposed to be absorbing carbon and instead they are emitting carbon. That's the problem that is occurring with the drought and um, uh, with the dry condition. And when you get hot and windy conditions, you have uh, tough conditions. So I'm going to actually start not so much with energy, but I'm going to start with saying that wildfires, uh, we really need a disaster risk reduction strategy for wildfires desperately before, during, and after wildfires. Like right now, we should be mobilizing on a grand scale for mitigating the effect of wildfires, not only in California, but along the entire West Coast, and in Colorado, wherever the forests are. And um, if you have to have a forestation, uh, absorb carbon, if you have to have reforestation, um, uh, we need strategies for wildfire minimization. We need, after the forest fires have denuded the country, the hillsides, and um, if you have heavy rains come, which often sometimes happens, you'll have landslides because there's nothing to hold the soil to the, to the hillside. And so um, uh, we, um, in order to have other land ecosystems, the desert and other ecosystems also revive and biodiversity to thrive. I, here's an, I put an idea that I had proposed in my book with a graphic is we need to do layout design of our forests so that it becomes a little bit easier to control our forest fires. <clears throat> anyway, we have to, get to grips with this because otherwise 
uh, the forest fires are going to lead to uh, a runaway greenhouse effect, which means the hot dry conditions create the forests and the forests create the carbon dioxide and the carbon dioxide produces more heating and, and we get increased problems. Coastal system, ecosystems can absorb enormous amounts of carbon. We've been destroying them uh, at quite a rate. You have mangrove swamps, salt marshes and sea grasses. In the Bay Area here, we have eelgrass, uh, which is a bladed, thin bladed grass. It has about 12 um, uh, feet to 13 feet uh, of, um, of um, um, carbon rich soil underneath it. Uh, so we really need to encourage that. <clears throat> California has done a lot of good things, a lot of detail over there. Uh, it was the only one, although the United States didn't sign up to the Kyoto Protocols to reduce its carbon emissions to 1990 level. By a certain year, California did that, and it actually met that in the year 2020, <clears throat> getting it back to 424 million metric tons by the year 2020. We are leading in renewable energy uh, and biomass energy. We have a cap and trade um, uh, thing to reduce greenhouse gases. It's a whole area. Some people think that's good. Other people think that's not too great. Uh, California has led in CAFE, which is corporate of average fuel economy standards. And we've led the country and the ones we've established generally have been adopted by the US uh, nationally. We are leading in electric vehicles and in green hydrogen. That is, I interpret green hydrogen as one that's mostly made from solar energy or renewable energy, but green hydrogen means other things to other people. <clears throat> Again, we uh, uh, the climate transformation goals uh, that California set for itself by 2045 and 45 and 2050, uh, we are talking about rapid decarbonization. Uh, I'll just summarize it here and say that um, uh, I'm proposing that we get 100% down by 2050 as advised by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, other people feel that we should really should be getting uh, to a much more aggressive things and do it by 2030. But you know, <clears throat> globally and us, we are, a, we are like a big ship. First, we have to reverse direction uh, and start reducing emissions. And, and then we can start to um, um, accelerate that process, you know, so as at least we don't overheat the planet. <clears throat> Energy, uh, this, I, I looked at uh, the uh, energy use for uh, California in 2017, um, 2.3 petawatt hours, which actually is an electrical unit of energy. Um, it is 45% dependent on oil and 28% on natural gas, which is about 77% in fossil fuels. Uh, we all use almost zero amount of coal, except that uh, Los Angeles does import electricity from Utah from a coal-fired power plant. <clears throat> I'm proposing, they propo there's various proposals. I'm proposing that uh, if the uh, energy use goes to 3.64 petawatt hours, which is a pretty significant increase in energy use, I'm proposing, as I'm proposing for the world, that we do it 15% with wind, 38, my calculation saying we can do it 38% with solar, 25% with energy efficiency, and 9% with what I call renewable storage, which means you take solar or wind or geothermal energy and you the process of electrolysis of water, which is hydrogen oxide, you create hydrogen and oxygen and then you use hydrogen uh, for energy purposes. It becomes a portable um, energy dense non-carbon fuel that can replace uh, gasoline and, and diesel, as well as you can use it at other places to make electricity or to substitute fossil fuels in industry and things like that. <clears throat> uh, here's what I'm proposing that we take all our natural gas <clears throat> power plants and replace them with SBH, solar plus battery plus hydrogen power plants. Um, so the solar PV power plant would during the day be charging the battery system, be providing electricity to the grid, to the customers and at the same time producing hydrogen. and at night, you could have a natural gas power plant turned on that provides you electricity at night if, uh, if that's uh, in the meantime. But once you get option two, which is hydrogen becomes available, you create excess hydrogen and you store it during the day, you can then go ahead and uh, use it uh, during the night. <clears throat> there was something called the duck curve, um, 
that basically CAISO, which is a California independence uh, systems operator, which actually runs the grid, uh, told, uh, had, had popularized. The red uh, thing is customer demand during the day. Uh, as solar co kicks in, the red one down below as it kicks in during the day, um, there's a rapid ramp down that occurs in non renewable energy source and then a rapid ramp up as solar in the evening. And they said that it was causing a lot of problems for our non renewable energy sources. <clears throat> what I propose in my book is what I call the hump curve <laughs> to replace the duck curve. And the hump curve says you oversize your solar system so that you can be charging your battery system as well as produce excess hydrogen. And you use battery power in the evening. And then you have, um, have uh, used the uh, hydrogen uh, power, uh, uh, you know, during the, uh, during the evening and early morning. Um, <clears throat> so this is the, the, the city of Los Angeles is uh, planning to replace the Utah coal power plant with, uh, where, uh, with um, uh, basically hydrogen by the year 2045. Um, and uh, that's a proposal that's uh, beginning to take shape. Gas turbines, once the gas turbines become available uh, from manufacturers that can burn hydrogen, you can have hydrogen, use hydrogen to uh, create power um, all the time. And these caverns, salt caverns have enough capability to store um, a, a, a long time's worth of hydrogen. <clears throat> Here's uh, talking about MCE. Here's a solar electric vehicle charging station right next to the headquarters in San Rafael, um, which Jenna had sent me a photo of. And uh, basically this is uh, a solar ch vehicle charging station where during the day, solar energy directly charges the electric vehicles and then it's grid tied. So rest of the time you're charging it to the grid just like uh, the rest uh, uh, of the world does. And so I'm proposing uh, concept of solar electric hydrogen highways where you have like a rest area, you pull into it and you can charge your vehicle. You can get a supply of hydrogen if you're a fuel cell vehicle. And uh, basically this would be a concept that would replace a gas station. Um, you'd have a solar electric hydrogen uh, station. And this, I'm proposing this for the United States and then for this uh, globally. <clears throat> anyway, um, uh, this is... Uh, my website, Brighter Climate Futures, uh, you please visit it because I try and keep it updated and use it as a communication tool. Uh, the Facebook page is Brighter Climate Futures. Uh, my email address is hlamba101 at gmail.com. Please communicate to me through that. Uh, I love to send out uh, complimentary copies of books. So if you don't have uh, a copy of my book, uh, write me an email. My email does appear on the last page of brighter climate futures also. Um, what can you do? You can educate yourself. You can be active locally. You can apply pressure and then you can link the local and the global. Uh, that's what we need to do if you have to achieve the global things. You know, we have to solve the global problem. The world, when they assemble in Glasgow, UK uh, for the United Nations meeting uh, needs to agree to solve solve this problem globally, have a come up with a plan and a strategy similar to a, what they did in a small way for the Paris Agreement. They need to do this in a big way and California can help lead the way if it gets it act together and continues its leadership. And we can prepare for the new economy with lots of exciting new kinds of careers. I'm gonna stop sharing here. I've run a little bit over my time so that I can then uh, uh, give the uh, uh, floor over to um, Rand Robel um, so that um, Rand can get started with his talk. Uh, Rand, where are you? There you are. <clears throat> Rand, you can unmute yourself and I'm going to make you the host so that you can uh, um, uh, sh share your screen if you need to. And after you get done, please uh, revert back to me by changing the host back to me. Uh, okay, Hari. Uh, hey, thank you so much. That was just wonderful. Thank wow, you. I'm so impressed by your work. Um, <laughs> just awesome, awesome work. And thank you so much for putting this all together. It's uh, a tremendous amount of uh, pulling it all together.
Thank you. Yeah, I, I've uh, written the book, but I, I said, hey, I have to learn from other people. And uh, some of the people uh, know more about the specifics of what they're doing. And, and, and so this is an opportunity for you to share your uh, knowledge and information with us. 